Welcome back to another episode of Questions and Answers, all about piercings with me, Scott Wilkinson. I'm your host here today, and behind the camera over here, we do have Jared, so say hey, hi Hey everybody, how you doing today? Cool, cool. So, sorry about last week. We had some internet connections. We couldn't get a real solid uh, connection at all, so we decided to just postpone till this week. So, hopefully, everyone tunes in. So, again, we're going to go through a bunch of questions. Um, be as specific as you possibly can. Uh, let us know how long you've had the piercing, what the problem might be, and uh, we'll do our best to answer as many of these questions as we can. So, uh, Ed, is there anything? Yeah, okay. So, a first question that we have from someone we were talking earlier is, how can you know when it's time to downsize your industrial? Because okay. people say to wait a long time, but then people have the long bar. What, what's? How do we know when it's time? It's a real tricky situation when to know when to downsize properly because – it does take a long time to heal, sometimes six months to a year to fully heal, but you need to downsize before it's completely at that point. Now, you got to wait till the swelling's gone down. You want it to heal up for probably a minimum of two months, maybe between the two and six months. I know it's a huge window, but it depends on how swollen you are, how you're taking care of it. If you're sleeping on it all the time, it's just going to stay swollen that much longer. So if it seems like you have a lot of antenna sticking out of there, you probably want to downsize to that shorter post. But if it's nice and snug, there's no room to downsize, then you can't really downsize. And wait a little yeah. longer. Yeah. All right. So Dancing Leaf has a question. Sure. Can you heal a piercing with piercing bumps on them? For example, I have a piercing bump directly around the hole of my helix, and it has a hoop in it. So what is probably the source of this problem? Probably the hoop. Um, if you're saying you got pierced with a ring or the hoop, the hoop moves back and forth. Uh, your piercing is going to swell. So your piercing, this is now this long. And when you have that curved ring through there, the more curve you have, the more it distorts tissue, which is why those bumps happen. So if you change to the stud, it'll probably help heal it up much, much quicker. Um, and yeah, people heal these with bumps just because you get a bump doesn't mean you need to take it out. You need to get rid of the source of the problem and then the bump will go away and you'll still be able to heal it up. So, All right. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. Good question. And then once we heal with the stud, we can put the ring back in and we probably won't have the problem again? Like, Yeah. Once you're healed up, that's when you can change to any of the fancy rings, clickers, um, rings without beads. Uh, just make sure you're fully healed up. Rings are great for septum piercings and doth piercings. But beyond that, there's not much I really start rings with. Excellent. Fallon has a question about piercings and school. Do you have okay. any tips of this uh, piercings you think are better for if you're going to school? And I assume we're talking about school where they don't want piercings. Yeah. Don't get pierced in school. I hear of people getting pierced in the bathrooms all the time. That is disgusting. Don't get pierced in your school's bathroom, please. Um, as far as like piercings go for school, if you if your school can't have it, you're very, very limited because you can do septum piercings where you can get pierced with a retainer, tuck it up inside there. And beyond that, um, you have belly button piercings. If you, excuse me, let me breathe, slow down and breathe for a second. Yeah, <laughs> quick, too much coffee, I think. Um, and if you're under 18, probably can't have the nipple piercings either legally so you're kind of limited limited to what yeah. you can hide in the septum i wish a good you one there. could but you have to heal your piercings all the way up before you can use those hideable retainers so emily sakuma asked actually a really good question that i think a lot of people wonder about and and and, and they feel awkward asking it's do females need to shave for genital piercings? And I'll even generalize that even more. Do do you need to shave regardless of gender for genital piercings? Does that help you? Does that hurt you? Is that something you want us to do? Okay. The most important thing is hygiene. If there's hair there or not, it does not matter. Now, back in the beginning, when I first started piercing in the early 90s, we used to always shave people. As a matter of fact, I just saw a video the other day, like piercing with a pro, where you always shave and use scissors to cut all the hair off. And like, no, you don't. Um, if you're actually shaving just fresh to the piercing, you could have hair follicles that could get pulled inside, which could cause additional problems. Hygiene's the only important thing. If, if there's hair there, it doesn't matter to me. Some people don't like it, but I mean, we're professionals. It doesn't, it's whatever you like. So it's not going to affect the actual piercing. Not it doesn't all. matter if there's hair in the area. Not you don't have all. to worry about the needle dragging a hair in or any weird like that. No, nope, okay. no, nope, not so this at all. Come as you are, but just be clean. Exactly, exactly. Perfect. It'd be the same thing with nostrils if that was the case. Like, should I trim my nostrils before I... You know, oh, it's, there's okay. a lot of tragus piercings sometimes have a little peach fuzz. I mean, it's crazy. Honestly, I bet people over. wonder. I, yeah. You know so, I mean? no, it doesn't matter. Thank you for asking that. That's a great question. 
Excellent. We love getting questions that, you know, because it's, it's difficult to think of all the things that people wonder about. You know what I mean? So it's nice to get mm -hmm. questions that are really going to apply to a lot of doing people. this for so long. It just it's to me, it's common sense, you know, because I've been doing it. I've been trained and trained and it's all I do every day. So just think about piercing. Yeah, that's all I do. All right. Bridget says, Scott, you literally read my mind. I took out my tongue piercing three days after I got it because of the webbing. And then you posted the video about it. <laughs> Glad I could help. Sorry you got a pierce and it didn't work out for you if that was the case. Renita wants to know, can you size up on a nose piercing? I currently have a 22 gauge and I want to go to a 20. Is that possible? So, so he's pointing that his are very, very large <laughs> and it's possible. So yes. how would she do it? Does she just cram a larger one in? Or? Um, cram's not the no. proper... Is it adjective? Is that the word I'm looking yeah. for? Adjective. Verb? Not the right verb. Verb. There we go. Okay. Um... Yes, you can totally stretch this up. You need to be healed up, and you can't have any crusties on there or tenderness. Now, once you're healed up, you'll be able to go up to the next size. Maybe you can get up to the 20 gauge, and in the shower, the hot water is going to loosen tissue up, and you'll be able to put that 20 in. Now, there's a good chance your nose is going to be sore for a couple more weeks again because it's stretching, and that cartilage needs to be displaced a little tiny bit. Now, once it's relaxed and comfortable again, then if you needed to, you could even go up to that 18 gauge. I mean, I went from... An eight gauge, which was pierced much larger, but I got all the way up to the seven sixteenths. So it just takes time and it's going to stay sore for a while. But as long as you don't rip or tear tissue, it's totally fine. Take your time. Oh, here's a quick one that's kind of fun. What's a good summer piercing? Meaning something that heals fast and maybe like I could still go swimming or something? Um, a tongue web. The uh, frenulum on the underside of your tongue, right underneath there. They heal super quick. Hopefully you're not drinking lake water. Okay, so with your mouth being closed, that's not a concern. Closed, it's, it shouldn't be a concern. I, as a kid, I yeah, I spit yeah. the lake gross. And but. and that's another thing that people should know. If you get a piercing, you're not supposed to go swimming for how long? Um, a minimum of a month. Most piercings are considered to be open wounds for a month. Sometimes it's longer. So if you caught it, ripped it, tore it, started bleeding again a couple days ago, and you go swimming in a lake, river, ocean, even a pool or hot tub, staph infections can happen, which is something none of us want. It's super bad. Yeah. All right. Uh, Darshini really wants to get a Medusa piercing, but is scared. Do you have any tips on the aftercare and maybe let us know what to expect? You are not alone. Every single person that gets pierced will get scared, whether they admit it or not. Some get more scared, some get less scared. Every person's different. But even me, after hundreds and hundreds of piercings, I still get butterflies. They're a little smaller than they used to be, but they're still there. So you are totally normal. Um, Proper preparation, a good night's sleep, maybe a good meal before you go in. So don't go there on an empty stomach. And if you have a good friend who's a good support team, bring them. Don't bring a bad support team. You want someone who's going to help you, not scare the crap out of you. Next you question. Can totally do it though. Yes, you can yes, do it. You and, got this. And it's not that. How painful would you say on the ten scale? I would rather have that pierced than stub my toe. Really. Any stub, any toe. Yeah. See? Piercing's That's a piercing. It's going to hurt a little bit, but it's not that bad. It's just more scary than painful. Um, pain scale, uh, a little bit above the halfway mark as far as the piercings go. Right. Not it's, bad. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I also put earlobes at like the two to three range. So this is just a couple notches above it. Not bad. No big deal. So the next question is how to get rid of a keloid. And, and they most likely don't mean keloid. They most likely just mean a bump next to a piercing. Correct. This is probably the, the largest uh, misinformation we have in our community using the term keloid because keloid is a medical condition where the skin is going to keep growing and the bump will never stop. Even if you had a cut on your arm that is not a normal scar, it keeps growing. That's what keloids are going to be. So if you have that medical condition, you would know before you probably got pierced. If you have just a normal bump on your piercing, these are irritation bumps. And most of the time they go away once it stops being irritated. So find the source of the problem, whether you catch a towel on it, shirt on it, if you're sleeping on it, or if you're just not cleaning and touching all the time, get rid of the source of the problem and the bump will go away. All right. We got a confirmation from Dancing Leaf that they did have, we were talking about the bumps on a hoop. Yeah. Uh, we had an oversized barbell in for three months and recently changed to the hoop and the bump started. So yep. yes, yep. you recommend going back to a stud. Now, a shorter stud or the original Definitely. stud? Well, I mean, if you have the bumps, you have to have the room for those bumps again. So don't put a shorter one in that pinches it. But if it's way oversized and it's moving, your piercing's irritated. So it's going to create those crusties and those crusties could get pulled inside. So the right side 
size bar is the best option. But yeah, once those bumps go down, give it a couple weeks after, and then you can try the ring again, and hopefully it works. A lot of time, the second time around, after those bumps are gone, most people don't have that problem again. And I made it to a live, and we're glad that you're here. Hey, welcome. All right. Misks says, I got snake bits done on March 18th. When can I put in the horseshoes and hoops? Um, I, when? Uh, March 18th. So less than a month ago. Probably. Generally, I would say about two to three months would be the earliest you could do it, as long as it felt completely healed. If you still have crusties on there, wait longer. And it's if you try to brush this, it's going to be like the question we just answered for Dancing Leaf. You're going to get bumps, and it's going to end up holding you back in the long run. Weeks backwards. Then you got to go back and wear those studs for another month to maybe month and a half before you can try doing the rings again. So patience is the key. Just wait another week or, or now, the now, another month, time. probably another month. Yeah, I was thinking a little absolutely because you know you just avoid it by being patient in the first place. You have a great looking piercing sooner than if you have to wrestle those bumps back and forth. Absolutely, for months. bumps are the last thing any of us want, so patience is the key. Awesome. Can I put a hoop in the healing antitragus? In a healing one, no. Once, it, well, you can do whatever you want. I don't suggest uh, you put it in there. Um, Cartilage piercings take so long to heal. Those crusts are just going to get pulled inside. It's going to really upset it. It's going to get way more swollen, and the ring would have to be way oversized. So you wouldn't be happy with any of the results, to be honest with you. Keep it in there until it's healed. All right. Alenka says, around my fresh piercing is creating the crust. Can I tear it off, or should I just let it there until I clean it? So how do we remove it, and should we just use our fingers? Like, like what's the way to keep that clean? You grow your nails off so you can get out. No, no, they, no, they no, think no, you're no, telling no, the truth, Scott. <laughs> um, if your crusties are getting pulled inside, you're getting a little bit of crusties, you need to use that wound wash spray and clean off those crusties. But if the crusties are building up and it just looks bad, but it's not getting rotated back and forth, leave it be until you need to clean it again. Yeah, don't ever pick them off with your fingers. If you're picking off crusties, you're not going to get it all off in one thing to start off with. You're going to leave little tiny micro crusties on there, which is now going to get pulled inside and now you're causing problems. Second thing is if you're using your nails and your hands, you're touching with dirty hands and it's probably going to get infected that way too, especially if your crusties are reopening up the wound. So don't pick them off, spray it off. And Now, what if I'm like a super clean person and I can't even stand those crusties being there? Is it a problem for me to like go to the bathroom and give it a spray with the wound wash and get rid of them whenever I notice them? No, because you can way over clean it. Your body is the only thing that's going to heal this piercing for you. And people over clean really like five, six times a day. And you're not letting your body get to that healing. It, your body's trying to form new tissue, new, and you keep flushing all of it out of there. Let your body heal. If the crusties aren't causing a problem, just that once, maybe twice a day is all you ever really need. Excellent. Yeah. So once, twice a day, Elenka, get those crusties off yep. there. But other than that, just try not to pull them into the piercing. I know a lot of us are just like clean freaks and you want to just over, over clean it. And it it's not good. You have to let your body work. That makes a lot of sense. It, it makes, I mean, we're overstimulated by all these medical products and this heals this and this does this. And it, right. our bodies are way more amazing than any product you could possibly buy. That is a great point. Just let it do its job. Yes. All right. I got my helix pierced about a year ago and it got caught on something. So now there's a bump. Mm -hmm. I've been doing heat compresses every night with saline solution, but it's not going down and I don't know what to do. Hmm. Um, so they didn't really say how long they've had the bump. Uh, a year. Well, the helix piercing is a year total uh -huh. and the bump seems to be recent. Like they, they caught it real hard okay. and created a bump. Sometimes it takes uh, weeks to months before these bumps really calm down and go away. Um, if your jewelry's now too tight and it's being pinched, it's not going to get better. You might need to put a longer bar in there. Is it the original jewelry you pierced, you healed it up with? You know, so that might be a factor. Um, if it's really swollen, that heat might be causing more, more uh, issues. So maybe back off a little bit and let your body just heal it up. Maybe the compresses might be doing more damage. I'm okay. hundred percent sure. At a year, it seemed like you were probably pretty healed. You caught it, snagged it. It should go back to normal as long as you don't mess with it too much. So and the other thing is maybe try emu oil. If the, those hot compresses with saline and whatnot aren't really working, emu oil might calm down that piercing and, and chill it out quite a bit. I love emu oil. I'm huge advocate of it. Absolutely. So, it, I mean, you've, I've seen it work magic myself. Take yeah. things that are that are bad and just seem to fix them. It's like magic, yeah. 
All right. Michaela wants to know, should I take out my nipple piercings for breastfeeding? This is actually a common question. Yes. Um, okay. Now, technically, no. If your piercings are all the way healed up, you could take your jewelry out, clean it up, and then you can nurse and put your jewelry back in. Now, in my experience of all the women I've talked to on this, they say that their nipples get pretty raw after nursing and after two or three times of even taking it out, you just kind of go, nope, they're staying out and you throw the jewelry. So if you got pregnant and you're going to start nursing, take the jewelry out, let them heal up. Baby is priority number one every single time. Let them heal up. You can nurse normally. And then sometimes the piercings will stay open. And you can slide the jewelry in after you're done nursing. Sometimes you just have to get them repierced. But, but that's yeah, generally, if you get pregnant, you know, you can leave them in for several months, you know, but if they're newer piercings, you don't want any sort of infection because crusties last a year to two years. You don't right. want that fed to the baby either. That makes sense. You're creating a wound essentially you on them. You need a fully, fully healed piercing if you want to take them out and try that. But if you've got pregnant by the time you're, you know, maybe only a year into having the piercings, just take them out. Take them out for the baby. Yep. All yep. right. Great question, Michaela. Thank, thank you, you very much for asking. Yes, thank you. All right. Hi, Scott. Should I move my helix piercing at all when I clean it? Uh, hang on. I lost my space. Okay. What an amateur. Uh, my piercer told me to move it back and forth, but I never did because everyone told me not to. That is old advice. Like my uncle said that when he got pierced, it was with a piece of string and he was supposed to move it back and forth. I know. I know. No. <laughs> No, it's it's the way it was said. It's like normally I say, trust your piercer. Don't listen to your friends. I say this all the time. But in this situation, your piercer's wrong and your friends were right. Right. <laughs> your friends are right in this situation. You don't need to move it back and forth. The spinning and rotating is from piercing guns at the mall. That's where that whole myth thing happened. Because if you don't spin or rotate it, your skin grows over the top. Now, if you went to a good piercer, they're going to give you enough room for an accommodate swelling. Or if you're over swelling... Go back and see them, and they'll put a longer post in for you. That's how it typically works. So don't spin or move it. Keep your hands off. Just spray it once or twice a day. Wipe off crusties with a piece of gauze or a paper towel. That's all I ever suggest. Because moving it back and forth is just going to irritate it. Yeah. It's just going to cause it to be upset. Mm -hmm. It's. It just bothers me that... Sometimes friends are so right and sometimes they're so wrong. And now it's kind of the same thing with good piercers and bad piercers. So it's like, who do we trust? Right. We I trust feel you, so Scott. Bad for you guys. It's like that's why I'm trying to do this channel. I'm trying to help out as best I can. Right. Because there's so much bad information. And then there's always someone just willing to take your dollar yeah. without really knowing what they're yeah. saying. All right. Rocco says, Good afternoon, guys. Love the content. Hey, Rocco. How would you stretch your lobes? How long between sizes? Now, generally, I say six to eight weeks minimum between each stretch. Um, sometimes it's a little bit longer. Sometimes a little less. Every person is different. Some people have super stretchy ears where they'll stretch it a week. And a week later, it's like the jewelry's falling out and they have to go the next size. If you're not hurting it, it's not a big deal. But it, there should be no resistance when you put it in if you're doing that. Generally, give it about a month and a half to two months. You should just slip yeah. right in. And then once you get to like the four, two, zero gauge kind of range, it does get a little tougher because the jumps kind of get a little bigger. And then it should start getting a little easier after that. Yeah. Terry had an accident last night and caught their eyebrow a little bit. Mm -hmm. It looks fine, but it bled a tiny bit. Is there anything I should be doing except for the saline spray and very gentle cleaning? Like, is there a first that's, aid? That's all you can really do. That's all you can really do. It's like first, yeah, just saline spray. Keep it clean until those crusties or those scab goes away. And, and hopefully it won't be too long before you're back to normal again. But, yeah, don't pick scabs. It, it sucks when that happens. I've done this so many times. Like, and just, oh, that's the end of that one. I'm like, no, I think it's still going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now, going back to what you said earlier, does that mean that that Terry's eyebrow is an open wound again? And like if we have a chance a to go bit. swimming in a, in a pool or a, or a lake tomorrow, we shouldn't do it? I, correct. At least keep your head above water. You, you need to stay away from that. That's, that's with any cut, scrape, open wound on your on your body. It's like if germs can get in, it can cause big problems that way. So, But with a fresh eyebrow piercing, that's a lot of open wound. With what you did is just – small kind of micro tear. So it's way less of a wound. So it should heal way faster. Awesome. So everything should be okay, yes. Terry. 
Tsunami says, help, I got my smiley pierced about 10 days ago and it's leaving an indent into my gums. Is it just because of the standard horseshoe jewelry or should I take it out? You should probably take it out. I hate saying it, but sometimes they work for people, sometimes they don't. But if you see that indent, it's doing damage. If it's the actual ring itself is leaving the indent, for sure. If it's just the beads, maybe you can It's only been 10 days, though, Yeah, too. I know that's too early. I'd take it out. You're doing damage. All right. Sorry. Watch your teeth. Your teeth are more important than a tiny bit of vanity. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So hopefully we can get that fixed for you. I hate hearing that when that happens. It and, does, though. You're not alone. Yeah, it does happen. And it's just it, it's better to take care of yourself than to try to force it and end up with a trouble. Correct. Correct. Anna W. says, I just started my new piercing journey. I had a septum and stretched ears. Uh, that I don't like because they don't fully close. I got a flat piercing last Saturday and plan on a rook in autumn. Awesome. Congratulations. It's a, it's a fun journey. And it's a long one, too, and you get all these jewelry out. It's so fun. Welcome to the world of piercing. And in the, like you were saying, like uh, we've talked about this before, stretched ears that don't actually close back up. Is mm -hmm. there anything to be done about that? Or is that just something that There's you... surgeons and doctors who can, I think it's mainly surgeons who will actually sew up your ears Purely a guesstimate here. I'm in Las Vegas. I heard about $750, $750 per earlobe to have things sewn up and back to normal again. Okay. Generally, about the zero gauge, uh, five sixteenths of an inch. Uh, is that like uh, six, seven millimeters is the kind of the point of no return? If I remember right, six millimeter. I think that's what it is. So, yeah, that's the point of no return. If you go past that, a lot of times you have to have them sewn up to be shut. All right. Gabriella says, I got my septum pierced six months ago. Can I change it to a ring now? Yes. Hopefully it's all healed up. If you're still healing things up, you should talk to your piercer to figure out why it's not healed. But yeah, you should be fully healed up. Generally, those take about a month and a half, two months, and you're done. Oscar says, hey, Scott, what piercings do you think go well with a septum? I would honestly have to see your face. Now, with septum piercings, it's centrally located. It gives you a lot of options, whether you keep things centrally, like, like a bridge, a medusa, if the septum's not too low, or a center lip piercing, like a labret or a vertical lip. You can always do symmetrical things on the side. So you have the septum, you know, two snake bites. There's a lot of options. You can kind of go the asymmetrical type where you have the eyebrow and the lip on the side to kind of draw the line. A lot of fun options. Now, annoying fans asking a question, if we send in piercing picks, would you be willing to tell us if it's pierced right or wrong? I have a couple of iffy ones that I might need to remove and redo. Now, on that note. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, this is something I'm totally willing to do. Um, Jared and I were kind of talking about this. Some people have sent in some pictures and we were actually going to show you some of the piercings they've gotten and they're inspired and they want to some show very us. very cool stuff. And the same thing can happen. If you send us problem pictures i'd gladly take a look at these pictures and we can talk about it on this channel too a little bit more variety and things to look at might be kind of a Absolutely. fun thing to do now we can't guarantee that we'll get a chance to look at everybody's pictures there, there could, will be a could be a huge flood come in so so i don't want to promise everyone that we'll for sure get to talk about your piercing but go ahead and send it in and there's a good chance that we'll get a chance to either help you with your problem or if you get a really cool piercing Yes. We want to see it, and cool, we'll, we'll unique, share it with the community. Fun jewelry options, things like that. Let us know. And like I said, we can't share everything, but we'll do our best to do quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, if I can help out in those ways, totally will. So speaking of that, do you want to see a cool, like, industrial orbital thing? I do. I do. One of our uh, fans, Diane, sent in, inspired by your videos and some of the cool stuff you've done on the What Should I Get Pierced. Right on. Went and did something super cool, and it looks like this. Yes. That, wow. That's really well done, too. See, like the orbitals, um, those orbitals going around the industrial. I've done like one or two of these in a very long, long time. Well, I haven't seen this in a long time. But the two run a parallel are perfectly placed. It's going to be a rough heel, but man, that looks good. Super. So cool. good. Love it. Thank you for sending that in. I'm so proud. I'm That's so awesome. Proud. You know, yes. you're inspiring coolness to happen yes. around the world. Think how many people look at that. Wow. All right. So, yeah, that's a, that's a cool thing. A little later, we're going to actually show a video from another fan of uh, getting some dermals. So cool. we're going we're to bring that up a little bit later. I, I just don't understand why you don't see more combinations of the orbitals around the industrials. Because you can do a lot of combinations and mix and match that way. And, think you need a really good piercer, though. You need someone yeah. who understands body swelling and is going to get those angles right. 
you had a good piercer. Sure. Thanks, Diane. All right. So, yeah, annoying fans, send it in. We'll see if we can get a look at it. We'll, do our best. we'll, we'll yeah. try to help out the people that send us pictures of, of things that might not be right. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. Send oh, it yeah. to piercingwithscott at gmail.com. Look at us. Piercingwithscott at gmail.com. We'll try to leave that in the, the comments. A little yeah, I'll throw it in the description, in the, in the too. Description, yeah. So perfect. Perfect. All right. Otis Bean says, hi, Scott. I wanted to get multi-navel piercings. Are they anatomy dependent? And also, what are your thoughts on them? What do we mean when we say multi-navel? hundred percent anatomy dependent. Now, typically when we're doing a piercing, we're looking for a ridge. The less ridge we have, the less of a chance of a piercing. For example, this is not a navel. This is an ear. But I this ridge here is kind of faint. It's not real strong. It wouldn't be an awesome candidate for a navel piercing. Now, on the other hand, if the ridge is like this, where it kind of goes in, you this is a good solid ridge. They would be able to heal this up really good. Now, one way you can tell, most people either have the upper or the lower. More people have the upper ridge than the lower ridge. But another thing you need to do is you need to lay down and kind of look at your belly button because that kind of changes the shape too. So some people will have the ridge all the way around and we can pierce those and it looks amazing, but not everyone does. So talk to your piercer. Some people only have the top part. And if that's the case, you can kind of do a, a two angles on the side, maybe one in the, in the center. So you kind of have like that... Um, a try thing going on you know sometimes you can work with an industrial going up and down through the top part and the bottom with a custom bar now you might need to work with some sort of chains and kind of links to kind of go in the middle there so you can bend and move back and forth i've done those in the past they're kind of tough to move but i have seen them they're awesome for if you're going out and you want to wear that healed industrial inside your navel you just can't wear it every day but Very yeah cool. it is anatomy dependent and there is some fun things you can do Awesome. Hey, hey wants to know when can I switch out my nip piercings to downsize them? Um, generally after a couple months, you can downsize to the shorter post. If you have a really, really long bar in there, you're gonna have crusties for a long time and the shorter bar will make it heal faster. So after a couple months, definitely get those shorter. Marta wants to know how do I know when my belly button piercing is healing the right way? So what are some signs of a of a properly healing piercing and how long should this take? Sure. Um Typically, for the first couple weeks to maybe a month, you might have some redness around that area. Um, your body's still in the healing process. And then once your body's a little bit more established and that fistula started forming, it's going to seem healed after a month, but you might get a little bit of crusties, but you're not healed yet. So, I mean, some redness, a little irritation happens for quite a while. Once the crusties are completely done, gone, you're completely healed. I would say expect four to maybe... Four to six months if you're wearing low-rise pants. If you're wearing pants, you're closer to rubbing up against it. A lot of times it takes over a year to fully, fully heal. So that might be a factor for you. If it's not healing right, make sure you're wearing pants that aren't rubbing directly on it. Absolutely. Fashion Huge choices. Factor. People don't yes. even realize, but makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Sharky's Cosplay says, hello from Texas. I really want to get my dollies done. Yep. We've watched your video. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else we need to know or watch out for? Uh, like, is there any like anatomy reasons why a person wouldn't or shouldn't get dahlias? Um, it could. I've never turned anyone down for it, but I imagine if someone didn't have, if it just got super, super thick real quick right there and it wasn't going to rest right, then it might not work. But I, I haven't seen that. So, so Chances are you're probably going to be okay. The posts have to be long for the swelling. You downsize. Once you downsize, they're so damn cute. All right. Yeah. So that's a vote for yes, Dahlia's Sharkies. Yes. All right. Ali Arachnid says, could you talk about losing your lobes and what made you decide it was time to do that? Well, there's Ooh. a video about this too, so you'll have to give us the brief. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do have a video and you guys should totally check it out. I will say at the end of the video, there is pictures. So it does get kind of gruesome and there's a little warning where my earlobes were removed and then cauterized and burned shut. And that's called losing my lobes. I believe losing my search. lobes. It's a pretty intense video, but anyways, um, I had my earlobes cut. It's called a relief cut to go a little bit bigger so I could stretch a little bit more because they were kind of stuck in a certain size. My earlobes started going necrotic, which means the tissue started dying because I didn't stretch my ears properly in the first place. I had all these blowouts. The blood supply got cut off and they died. And a week later, I lost my earlobes. 
that's the just of it. But you need to check out the video. It's worth a watch. It is because it's a warning, man. Like if you if you love your earlobes, but you want to go big, you you could go too far. For real. Mistake. For real. And it's like people don't understand. It's like, what am I getting myself into? And it's like, do it right. And so many people come out like, hey, I'm tough. I can take it. It doesn't hurt. And I'm like, that's not what it's about. If you do it proper, you'll have nice, healthy earlobes. I don't have earlobes because. Because you were too tough. I was too tough. That's what it is, man. You're so tough. That they, they came right off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Ridiculous. a warning to yes. those who would listen. Yes. Uh, Pol- Thanks for asking. Polish says, uh, what are the things to say to a parent to convince them to allow a nostril piercing? But it's what all the cool kids are doing. Yeah, try that one. That's what I would go with. I mean, yeah. (laughs) Um, Sometimes bribery works. Um, (laughs) I don't know if you can do the dishes. Or or give your allowance back. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I'm the wrong person to ask for that. I was not allowed to get pierced until I was 18 years old. And I asked every year. I got nowhere with it. Right. Nowhere. But once I turned 18, my dad brought me to get my earlobes pierced. So I mean, he's like, he's like, I'm not going to win this battle. So let's just so, join him. And yeah. Actually, I just came up with the answer. You did. This, this kid needs to just take a picture of you and be like, mom, if you make me wait till I'm 18, I'm not just going to get one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I say that. I, was, I had all this built up piercing energy, and if I don't, you you know, I could turn into a piercer. It could happen. You know what I mean? I could be a real professional. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Squid says. Good luck. Or no, actually, I, I uh, how Michelle loves watching you live. Thanks, and Michelle. How long do we wait between getting two helix piercings that are around seventy-five millimeters apart? That's a lot. That's a lot. That's yeah. like um, helix piercings. Is that like the width of your ears? Yeah. Is that you, both sides of your head? You should be totally fine to get the piercing whenever you want, as long as you're not healing too much at once. If you're already healing this ear, might as well heal the other one at the same time so you still have an ear to sleep on. In my opinion, there's nothing worse than getting a piercing, healing it up for 6 to 12 months and going, let's do that again. <laughs> Why not just get the piercings, have all your fun in the beginning, and then to spend one healing time? That's the way to go about it if you can. Makes sense. Killing yeah. two birds with a yep. same stone. As long as it's not swollen and affects the angles and all that stuff, it sounds like they're playing far apart. Squid has a regular librette and wants to know if it's possible to switch it to a vertical librette. Nope. Um, <laughs> it's just a different piercing. It's a different angle of hole. Yeah, it, it just doesn't work that way. Like Back in the day, I know you used to wear one for a while. Yeah. There was a specialty okay. piece of jewelry. Let's, can we go to the... Yes. So basically what I'm is you would have like the normal librette area where you'd have the ball in the front, but the top part here would curl up and come over the top. I remember you used to be able to buy these like at Hot Topic or something like that <laughs> yep. back in the day. Um, and it kind of replicates having the bead on the top and the bottom. And, you know, so that's the closest you could really get. I don't know if anyone makes good quality pieces of jewelry in this shape anymore. You would have to really do your homework, but that's a possibility. But otherwise, it's completely different angle. The only thing you might be using is where the reference hole is on the bottom, but sometimes it's even a little higher up. So, interesting. You so, might even be able to get away with both if it's a little lower now, do a vertical rate right up above it. So, you'd have two beads, one being the vertical and then one straight in. So, a total of three. Yeah, a total of three beads, which could be, be kind of a cool, cool look. I want to do that now. Now he's excited. All right. All right, Caitlin, I have a rook piercing. Uh, and uh, and I lost my place. I'm terrible. Caitlin, I have a rook piercing for several years, but when it gets irritated and sometimes has wet, green gunk, or liquid, is this an issue? <laughs> it's not good. Um, <coughs> trying to think here. Do you ever change your jewelry? Could it be a quality of jewelry issues? If your jewelry is tarnishing, could it be from that? Or are we talking actual like pus or some sort of infection? Um, I, I really don't know. Best thing I can say is like be, make sure you're cleaning it and make sure it's a good quality jewelry. That's the best thing I can say here. So Just keep cleaning it. Yes, keep cleaning it. All right. Uh, Bridget says, I'm wanting to change out my nipple piercing soon. Do I need to do a piercer or can I find good quality jewelry online and switch it myself? Is that a bad idea? Um, uh, you, you can find good quality jewelry online. Where? 
I don't know because there's so many people who lie about it. That's the best thing I can say. People come in like, no, it's surgical steel. I'm like, well, it's bright red. How is that surgical steel? It's painted. There's other things on there, whether it's externally threaded, not the internally. Uh, Going to have to have the right size. Do you know what right size Chewy you have? Now, if you were to find the right size and good quality jewelry, yes, you can change that yourself. Now, basically what you're going to do is you're going to take the one bead off and you're going to get things kind of lubricated, whether it's like with soap and water, just so the jewelry moves back and forth. And you're going to take the one bar and you're going to butt it up to the other and the one will push the other one out. So there's always something in there. It's really not that difficult to change as long as you're all the way healed up and it's quality jewelry. So that's an interesting point. You're saying you don't just take the first one out and then put the second one through. It's no. got to be a combination. One pushes the other. That's kind of thing. the easiest way I found because your piercing never removes tissue. It makes a crescent incision and pushes tissue off to the side. So it's forced like this. Our body naturally wants to go back to that natural position. So that's why if you have something butted up, like as soon as you take it out, it's starting to close up a little bit. So it's trickier to get in. So if you butt it up, Makes it a lot easier. All right. Pro tips right there. Yes. So keep that in mind, Bridget, as long as you can find some decent jewelry. And you just want to look for titanium if possible. That is the, the implant grade thing. titanium, um, internally threaded. They come in different lengths and different thicknesses. Here at Piercing Vegas, where my, my studio, I write down everyone's jewelry on the back of a pamphlet so people know what size jewelry they're actually wearing. Some piercers do this. Hopefully you have one of those piercers who did that for you and you have the right information. Otherwise, you might need to go get sized. AK says, thank you for the tip about the emu oil. It really helps a lot. And greetings from the Netherlands. Excellent. Greetings from the Netherlands. And yeah, that emu oil is amazing stuff. When you have problem bumps, it just, it helps. I love that stuff. Now, Karen has an interesting <laughs> question here. Sure. I have a pretty new nostril piercing, only eight weeks old. And there's a small white ring around it. Is that normal? Does it mean it's healing? Is it bad? It's normal. What you're seeing is probably the fistula. The white rings, like if you kind of push up on it, um, the same thing can happen with earlobes. Like if you take your ear, you know, and you push, you can almost see like a white ring. Now, over time, that fistula is probably going to calm down and settle in a little tiny bit more, but it's not the end of the world. So um, unless it's a little bit of scar tissue building up and coming out. And with that, it'll probably go down more of a time, but it doesn't sound like anything to be concerned about. Similar question to one we had earlier, but not so specific. Is it bad to downsize the bars on your healed piercings in general yourself, or should you go to a doctor for that? Or what? Or not a doctor up here, sir. <laughs> what, which piercings do you think it's hard to do by yourself? Stuff you can't reach or get the right angle. Um, a doth piercing is not an easy one to change yourself. A rook piercing is very, very difficult. The forward helixes, triple forward helixes, because you got to hold on to the jewelry and go from the back forward for a lot of these things. Um, nipple piercings aren't that difficult. Navels are fairly easy. Industrials are fairly easy. Just screwing the beads on. Bridge piercings are tricky. You know, it's easy to access both, but as soon as your fingers touch these beads, I am now blind. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, you just kind of think about it, like, am I able to do this? Can I see what's going on? Can I get a good grip on both of them? Then you might be able to do it. But but when in doubt, might as well just have a exactly. professional because you could lose a piercing if you mess it up, correct? And all of these are all variable, too, because if you have a real long nails – you're not a good candidate for changing your jewelry now, too. Right, or any you jewelry, know, if you have, really. Yeah, real long stiletto nails, you can't get in there to do. So, but then again, some people wear nails like that are so talented. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you from a question we uh, answered earlier. The bump was about two months old, and it is the original bar and downsize. Okay, so. okay, cool. You're very welcome. All right. Gargamel says, is it a bad idea to get an orbital helix if I don't have much experience with cartilage piercings or healing them? Is that a place to start? Um, it's a rough heel. Um, but if you're the true Gargamel, you should understand what frustration is like trying to get all those Smurfs and whatnot. Yes, that's, that's, is that where the Gargamel comes from? I believe from? that's the Gargamel. The Smurfs, I don't cool. know any other Gargamel. Um, in dust, an orbital piercing is going to be a year plus to heal up. It's really, really rough. If you're just doing an orbital in the earlobe, maybe it might be only a couple months. It's awesome, but it's a big first step. That's all you have to say. It can be done, but it's a long, long heel. Are there any specific brands of emu oil that you recommend? Um, 
Desert Palms Emu Ranch is the only one I have ever used. I've never had any problems. I love their product. I don't know about other things. I right. really that, don't. That's the one you've used. That's the it one should I've all used. be the same. But and they no. really, really push towards the piercing thing. I don't know if other companies who work with the emus push towards the piercing, but Desert Palms Emu Ranch has been involved in the piercing community probably 20 plus years. Wow. So they've been around for a it's, long yeah, time. Yeah, they're not a new person around the block here. So they've been around a while. That's cool. And you don't last forever if you're not providing something that the Correct. community it works. Appreciates. It works. So, yeah. All right. Connor says, hey, guys. What's up, Connor? Uh, hi, Scott. How do you know if you can't pierce your tongue web? Um, generally, what I have people do, let's see if I can describe this properly, is kind of create like a suction with your tongue on the roof of your mouth to kind of create your web to get nice and thin. Like, does that kind of, can you see that, Jared? Yeah, that's visible. So once you do that, I have access. But if you have to, see see how you can't see my web when you just lift your tongue out? Yeah, the, the web sucks in. But then when you do that, it sticks out. Everything sucks in and I can have access and it's going to stay put. So that's my determining fact. If you can't create that suction and you don't have that web, I'm not going to do it. The other thing is, is the tongue web is only going through that thin tissue. Mine looks thick because I had my tongue web cut many, many years ago. But um, in general, you do that, it's going to be paper thin. If you took a flashlight, light almost goes through it. It's super easy, and that's the, my only prerequisite. Good question. Very I've been good asked question. that one before, yeah. Here's another one that you'll like, because Scott actually has uh, done woodworking and making plugs and things in the past, yes, correct? Yes. The Uncrowned King wants to know, are there any paints or varnishes that are safe for piercings if you want to make a custom piece? How did you deal with that? Okay. Um there are certain varnishes which are technically safe. I didn't ever use them because I don't trust them. Not even every wood or material is safe to wear in a healed piercing. Some woods are very toxic. I'm not sure if you're talking about woods or probably varnish, probably woods. Varnish, probably talking um, wood. What I did is for me personally, I used olive oil. I would sand my plugs wet sand them like multiple times until you got them super, super smooth. And then I would actually douse them in olive oil, let them soak for 10, 15 minutes for that oil to really penetrate into the wood. And then I would wipe it off with like a, a paper towel basically. And then I had a buffing wheel that I had beeswax on. So I would get a bunch of beeswax and I would pack and that's what I would use for the varnish or the polish. It's it works really well. It holds up for a long, long, long time. And eventually, if you need to add a little bit more wax, you can kind of do it with a paper towel. But that's what I used, and it holds up beautifully. Be careful of the woods you use. Some woods are extremely toxic um, and need respirators in the full full nine yards. Wow, it. like but even just for the dust? Just for the dust and like working with – you don't think you're doing damn – yeah, you're breathing that stuff in, and it's extremely toxic. So do your homework on your woods. But – I loved wearing wood plugs when I could. It's the most comfortable, and they're just so beautiful. Right. Yeah. So recommended. Yes. Beeswax and Good olive question. oil. Yeah, that's that's the way I did it. Uh, oh, normally most companies don't use olive oil because over time, olive oil can spoil. I was making olive oil for myself. It was on oh. my plugs. I was wearing them all the time. But some companies won't do olive oil. They use like a mineral oil. There's other types of oils because it has a shelf life when you put it on there. You don't want something that could spoil if it's not used over time. I some, smell bad after smell a long bad, time or something. Smell bad, kind of funky or something like okay. that. But I used olive oil. I loved it. But a lot of people use mineral oil too. Excellent. Space Cat Overlord wanted to ask, if I had a bridge reject, can I get it re-pierced again in the future? If it came all the way out, that tissue is way thinner than normal, um, and it'd probably reject out again. Now, if you're going into a different placement, uh, maybe, uh, it also depends on your anatomy. Maybe you weren't a good candidate for this piercing in the first place, because not everybody is. Like, as you can see mine, I have I have a lot of tissue. I, you can hardly mm -hmm. feel the bar through there, it's so, it's so deep. But that's because my bone kind of scoops in a little tiny bit. If it's rubbing up against the bone, you're gonna get bone erosion, so deeper isn't always the answer. Just depends on your you anatomy. Have the right anatomy for it. So, yeah. All right. Connor wants to know is there any uncommon piercings that you want to do? Because I got myself a fresh snotch piercing Saturday pass. <laughs> awesome. Um, fresh snotch. Yeah, I just did a snotch on a, a counter girl not too long ago. Worked really, really well. It looks super, super cool. 
And actually, Emily, yeah, I just pierced her uh, mantises last night, too. That's cool. Yes. Let's get some pictures and feature those. Yeah, on for sure. I got to show something. you her nose. It's so epic. So epic. Rebecca Bailey has a question. Uh, she has read that in the piercing Bible, Elaine Angel suggests that the Christina piercings can cause long-term discomfort with front-facing sex. And I've also heard that they're prone to migration. So what is your general thoughts on a Christina? I mean, it's possible. Uh, sometimes finding the right jewelry that fits, you know, it might be might be the answer. It kind of depends on whether it was pierced with surface bar, a curve bar, the J bar. Um, for, for those that don't know, what is a Christina piercing? What are we talking about? Okay, Christina piercing is basically the almost like the pubic mound area where you have the outer labias come together and it's just that little lip on the top. So a lot of women know what the VCH is, the vertical clitoral hood. It's like a higher version of that. And it's generally higher up on the skin. Okay. So, um, and like I said, we'll go back to this here. Some people will use a surface bar where it's like a bar like this with flat discs on the top. Some people will use a curved barbell, like a big happy face like that. And some people will use like some sort of an L bar like so. So those are the three different kind of options that people pierce with. Depends on your anatomy. Now, yes, Elaine Angel is right. Like it can cause irritation and it can reject. But same thing with navel piercings, same thing with eyebrow piercings, same thing with nipple piercings. Doesn't mean it's not worth giving it a shot. It's just a possibility and that can happen with virtually any of the piercings. So, And uh, have you done a lot of these? Do you find that your clients have uh, success when they get this usually? I've never had anyone come back and say I had to take it out because it was too irritating. Okay. I'm not saying that didn't happen. I mean, not everyone's going to say come to me with all their problems. Like, if it doesn't work, you just take it out and it's right. You move on, you know. But no, no failures that you're aware of. That I'm, yeah, exactly. Very good. So, all right. So, hopefully, that helps you uh, think about that, Rebecca, and make and, your. And I'm not saying Elaine decision. Angel's wrong. She's absolutely right. It's always a possibility. She's covering all bases here. But it's the same thing, you know. It's like, should you not get it? It's every piercing's a gamble. There's mm -hmm. a possibility any piercing might not heal up. But as soon as you notice discomfort, if you take it out, there's very little long-term problem, correct? Yeah, the issue's gone. You get rid of the source of the problem. Yeah. You just don't want to ignore it until the bar works its way completely out correct. or whatever. Correct. Correct. All right. right. And you know what? I never answered. I don't remember who. I was a Connor who asked earlier, uncommon piercings yeah. um, that I'd want to do. Um, there's some uncommon piercings that I've never done. Like, I've never done... Um, uh, let me see. <laughs> Hard to think of one that you haven't it done. It really, really is. There's just a couple, a couple weird. Like I might have done a rhino piercing. I'm not sure. I don't think I've ever done an Austin bar where it's side to side through the tip of the nose. I don't really have a desire to do them. I just and someone would have to walk in the door and ask. Yeah, you know, and it yeah. just hasn't happened. Yeah. So, um, fun combinations. I love piercing combinations, and you know, like creating that kind of theme. That's, that's why, and I'm more about the experience. You know, you come in, I want to give you a good, positive piercing experience. You're wearing the piercing. It's not about me. It's all about you. Cole has a question. Should ears be illuminated before getting pierced? Love your videos. First of all, what are we talking about? Okay. Um, I'm going to, do I have one here? Um, let's see. I think here. I thought I had one. I had my here this. Well, what we're talking about here is like a little pen light similar to this. Um, and basically what I do is I'm going to light it up and I put a glove over the top. And when I hold this behind the ear, a lot of times you can see veins and things coming through. Um, you should try to map out for veins when I'm doing a dot for like a helix piercing or conch piercing. If I see veins or things like that, I avoid them. Now, is it the end of the world if you hit them? Not the end of the world. Um, you might get some bruising. It might be a little longer healing process. It could be a faster healing process because cartilage doesn't get the blood flow, and therefore you might be getting all those white blood cells to the area to heal it quicker. And I don't have a solid, solid answer, but if it's a big vein, I try to avoid them, and pen lights can help with that. Now, does that mean a piercer is a bad piercer if he doesn't bust out a flashlight every single time? Is no. it a necessary tool? Not at all. Not at all. Like, if I'm doing a normal conch piercing at a 16 gauge, I don't bust out the pen light each time. Now, if I was to do a larger gauge conch piercing, I'm going to check it out because I don't want to 
you know, because that's going to be doing a larger cut and more damage. Okay. Um, veins, things like that, can kind of roll a little tiny bit, so you kind of avoid them a little. Um, but no, they're not necessarily a bad piercer, but I, I am looking for them, even though I'm not using a pen light every single time. Okay. So, and I have bright lights everywhere, too. So, that's another thing to keep in mind. It's like if I have you tilt your head back, I'm looking using ceiling lights to kind of look look through your so, okay yeah, so just because there's more i'm doing that i don't even realize i'm doing yeah. absolutely good so, question yeah try to avoid veins if you can help it very cool <laughs> all right kate has a problem uh oh last year i changed my two-year-old septum piercing to some cheap jewelry that i got online mm -hmm. this is a warning that everyone should pay attention to i had a bad reaction to the jewelry and i eventually had to remove it with pliers now i've got the previous good jewelry back in but the septum still hurts when I change the jewelry and it occasionally feels weird slash cold. Is there anything I can do about that? Or is this just my life now? Weird cold. I don't know. Um, I hope you have good quality jewelry back here. I don't know if it's the original jewelry you're saying. Yeah, we said the original jewelry. So it's it was good enough to heal up the first time. Um. Just find a different piece of jewelry. Maybe it's too big for you. Maybe it's, you know, like if you get a solid, like a, a seam ring or a clicker ring where it can like be nice and snug there, maybe that'll help. Uh, change it to maybe a niobium ring instead of the titanium ring. Or do you have the steel ring in there? Different metals can have different reactions. Now, when you buy stuff online, like, oh, it's surgical steel and you get it in and like I said, it's pink or green or some other weird color and it's, or they just lie because there's no one who backs up their, claims so that's kind of the issue buy from a quality piercer maybe try different metal a different size it still can work for you carly says hey hi and caitlin r has a great question i want to get a nipple piercing but i want both done mm -hmm. do you suggest that i get them both done at the same time or wait between piercings Okay, now I'm assuming you're saying in the same sitting, meaning one piercer um, piercing one nipple and then immediately going to the other. Yeah, I highly recommend doing both at the same time. You're going to hear a lot of people say, oh, the second piercing hurts more than the first one. Maybe a couple percent, maybe two or three percent more than the first one, but I can almost guarantee you that it's not going to hurt as bad as you expect. Okay. Okay. So even that second piercing is still going to be less painful than what you're expecting the first one to be. So don't let people get in your head, get them both done at the same time if you want them. And if you're really nervous about that, there's something called tandem piercings. I don't have it offered at my shop right now, but that basically means you go to a shop who has two piercers on staff, we'll have a piercer on both sides. It's one deep breath in and both nipples are pierced at the same time, which is a super cool experience. And is that you... That do you feel like it's like ripping the bandaid off fast? It's less pain total if you get it done together. Yeah, because you get one piercing done and you're immediately gonna be nervous for the second one. You only have to get nervous for the one piercing this way. Okay, so yep. it's about your head. It's about it how is. you feel. About it's it. all psychological. But I mean, if it bothers you and you're really scared about the second one, go get tandem. So it's only one breath and you're done. And it's gonna seem like one piercing. Very cool. I had that done with my conch piercings, and it was uh, it was the way to do it. I liked it. Nice. Yeah, I liked it. I liked it. Uh, I also been tandem tattooed, which I don't recommend. <laughs> I had my chest and my head at the same time. And normally when they're tattooing, also it's like, oh, I could breathe because they're dipping in the ink or something. There was no breathe time. It was oh. zzz, at both same time. But, and so you never get a break. You don't get I, that I, I moment to chill out. Relax. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was intense for me. <laughs> Carly has a good question. Sure. How do I ask about an apprenticeship without being awkward? What is a respectful and respectable way to ask? Um, in person, uh, don't come in just never getting pierced by that piercer. You should probably have a piercing or two by them to know what they're all about. Um, and if you go in and say, like, like if you're coming into me, what I would hope for is like, hey, Scott, you've been, you pierced me several times. I really am interested in becoming a piercer. Are you looking for any sort of apprentices at this point in time? Or what would I need to do to become an apprentice? You know? Okay. That's a professional way. Don't call up and go, hey, do you do apprenticeships? No? Okay. Click. Because guess who's never getting an apprenticeship? Right. Yeah. It's just not the way to do it's it. It's just not the way to do it. Going in person. Make sure you have some sort of a reputation, not a reputation, but 
They should you know, know you. The person. They yeah. should know you at the shop a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we should have an idea. Does someone walking in saying, do you do apprenticeships and walking out? I, I don't know who you are. I need to see personality. I need to see that you're an enthusiast about this. I, mm-hmm. you know, That you would fit in with the group who works here currently. Exactly. That's what we're kind of looking for. Because it's a family atmosphere. You don't just let anyone in, you know. Right, because everyone, like, they are. Yeah. right, you're together all the time. Awesome. Well, Good that question, hopefully yes. helps Carly. And, and yeah, just, just respectful and straightforward. Perfect. For real, go into the shop. Don't email. Don't send us a text or call. <laughs> Stop in. That's the way to get a real apprenticeship. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you from Annoying Fan uh, for t- getting questions answered. Perfect. Oh, one more thing about that, too. Don't expect a yes ever right away. Oh, on the question of an apprenticeship. Yeah. You come and say, hey, can I get an apprenticeship? Yeah, sure. When do you want to start? I don't know if that's ever happened. Okay. Uh-huh. You got to say an apprenticeship. Let me think about it. Da, da, da. You come in and get pierced one or two more times. You know, you start asking questions and like, hey, if you, you know, just keep asking. Don't be annoying about it. But just once in a while, like, hey, have you thought more about the apprenticeship? I'm, I'm still not looking. It doesn't mm-hmm. bother me when people ask. Okay. But if you just call every day, what about today? What about today? What about today? That's That's different. All right. So put in the effort and might just work out for you. Persistence. Anna B says, Scott, does surgical steel rust? I did a piercing and then when I changed the jewelry, the bar looked kind of rusted and none of my friends had this and I'm scared I did something wrong with the aftercare. (laughs) No, you did. Well, I don't know what you did for the aftercare, but you didn't do anything wrong that would cause that jewelry to rust. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Stainless steel does not rust if you got the jewelry online or like... People are claiming some of these, the crap jewelry is is not what it actually is. You know, like, oh, it's surgical steel. It's probably not the surgical steel, greatest steel it's supposed to be. That's why it's rusting. So yeah. Not your fault at all. Just get a better piece of jewelry and you won't probably have this problem. Unless you bought a 99 special on Amazon or something, then, eh. <laughs> Awesome. We got some love for Diane's pick. That's super cool. Orbital that was industrial. super epic picture, wasn't it? Can we show that one more time? Absolutely. Bring that up here when you get a chance. Yeah. And there it is. I'm so good at my job. Oh, so awesome. And also look at that. She got a snug, looks fully healed. The anti-trag is fully healed. That's an enthusiast. That's a beautiful ear. Absolutely. Very wow. well balanced. Wow. Uh, it, for real. That's a curated ear if I've ever seen it. It's perfect. Yeah. Now, Makes me so happy. Onyx Seer has a bummer. They're in California where I guess nobody is really piercing under the mask and they uh, want to get their smiley done. So it's holding them back. Mm-hmm. It's a bummer. There, there might be spots, but don't just go to any or the first place that allows you to do it to do your homework, go to a good quality spot. Um, I'm not that far from California. It depends on where you are in California, but I'm in Las Vegas. All right. Come see me in Las Vegas. Come visit. Plan yeah. a trip to Vegas. Get a little hole poked in you while you're here. Eat some good food and see some good shows and maybe win a million dollars. Very cool. I don't know. Terry says, thanks to (laughs) Scott. I'm getting a UFO piercing. If my piercer agrees, I have the anatomy. Good luck to you. I hope you do. And if you get it done, send us a picture. I'd love to see it. And Diane is here herself says, thank you for the inspiration, Scott, the owner of that beautiful ear. Yes, it was my pleasure. And thanks for sending that in. So amazing. So Sky has a question. What piercings should someone get who's afraid of pain slash extensive cleaning? Like what's, what's a really easy one? Uh, Ear lobes are generally pretty easy. Most oral piercings are fairly quick and don't take as long. So a normal lip piercing, labret, um, those are fairly easy. Cartilage piercings are going to take a lot longer to heal up. Um, how painful is like the tongue web or the smiley or frowny? Tongue web, yeah. Uh, smiley and frowny are easy piercings, but they can do damage. So if you're kind of nervous about that type of a thing, you might want to steer away from that. But yeah, tongue web is probably one of the easiest. Yeah. You're going to be scared. Everyone gets scared. Totally normal. Even I get scared. That makes it fun. Ursula's Odds and Sods says, are new piercings prone to swelling more than usual on a plane, or is it fine to fly soon after getting a piercing? Have you ever heard about oh, that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it does swell a little bit more. Um, hopefully, you still have enough room for swelling. When I put enough room for swelling in something, I don't do it so it's it's the exact. I make sure you have enough. I don't overdo it, but you should have more than enough. So, And it's just a temporary well, like when you land again, does the swelling go back down usually? Is this something that's just during the flight? A little or? bit more pressure up there, but it's it's not the end of the world. Sometimes people can bleed a little bit. Okay. You know, if you're on a plane because of the pressure and whatnot on open wound and, 
you know, so, but generally it's not a problem. It's not going to like cause the piercing to reject no. or anything. No. Now, if you had a genital piercing where there's more blood flow to the area, you might bleed a little tiny bit more on something like that, but that would be about it. Now we have the next question is about lip piercings and teeth damage. Uh, I've recently become interested in getting a lower lip piercing, but I'm worried about tooth damage. What, uh, what can we do to avoid? Downsize your jewelry and don't play with it. Um, if you're talking about a labrette piercing in the center of your lip, um, the post has to be long and there's a possibility of tooth damage within the first month of having it because you have to leave the long post in until you downsize. Now, once you're downsized, it should be fairly flush and almost creating a pocket inside your lip to where the disc shouldn't uh, do damage to your teeth. Now, the big concern over, even if you have downsized jewelry is if the, you're not checking the beads and the jewelry came out, if you bit down on it and got into your food, there you could still do damage that way. Right. That's Just kind of the bigger concern. Metal. So um, check your beads. And if you downsize your jewelry, you shouldn't have too many problems. It's always a small possibility. Trolled Guard wants to know if you have any tips on clients who pass out. How often does that happen? Um, very, very rarely, to be honest with you. Uh Passing out normally is a psychological thing, um, and I generally talk people out of it. I, I think that's the easiest way to say it. You know, people look at me and go, I think I'm going to pass out. I'm like, no, you're fine. I said, it's just a huge adrenaline rush. This is what people get addicted to. Just take a deep breath and relax. Just calm down and relax, and everything will go back. And that's all they need to do is lay them down, just take some deep breaths. Once they relax, they realize they're going to be okay. But a lot of times we go into this panic mode, like, I'm going to pass out. I'm going to, you know, and you hold your and breath and you tense up. And it's, it. don't freak the person out, and you talk them out of it, and they go right back to normal. As long as I'm not freaking out, they generally calm right, to, right down. That being Since said. Since I've had my shop for five years, I think I've had – three people pass out and I do 20 to 30 piercings a day. So that's very low odds of it's, happening. It's a possibility. I've also had one person come in one time who like she passed out, came to passed out, came to and passed out and came to and her friend's like, Oh, you're doing so good, sweetie. You know? And I was like, doing good. You're like, yeah, she normally passes out like this at the eye doctor. I was just like, tell your piercer if you're prone to passing out. <laughs> <laughs> just so it doesn't freak them out. <laughs> Just let well, us know. The best thing to do, lay the person down, get them to relax, bend your knees so they're higher in your head because passing out is because lack of blood. And then, yeah, that's that's about it. Don't have them jump to their feet. It's not a big deal. People are out for a second and they come back to, they're going to be freaked out because you don't know what happened, where you're at. Why. So if someone passes out, first thing I'm going to do is like, my name's Scott. You just got pierced here at Piercing Vegas. Your belly button's pierced. You just passed out. Just stay relaxed. You're on the ground right now. And, you know, once you're calm, we'll have them sit back up, get them a glass of water. And after 10 minutes, you know, as long as they're not driving, then I'll allow them to leave if they have someone there with them. Everything's cool. It's not a big deal. Not a big deal. Just a, It happens when people give blood and stuff, too. I think it's just the, the nerves of the moment. It's all about the nerves. You know, and the funny thing is, last thing people say before they pass out is almost 100% of the time is, that didn't hurt a bit. <laughs> and then they go out. It's, it's wow. adrenaline and it's all psychological. And yeah. the release almost. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So go to a good piercer you trust, and that will minimize the chance that you pass them out. Zat Zodal wants to know if I put soap while I bathe on my nipple piercings, is it possible to get any harm from that? One of my nipple pierces started bleeding, and I don't know why. Some soaps can be really, really harsh on new forming skin. Um, if you ever had an operation, anything like that, doctors and surgeons don't ever tell you to clean with soap and water. I say try to keep it dry and keep it avo avoid from all that stuff so your body can naturally heal it. Now, I'm not saying don't use soap. We need the area to be clean. Just don't focus on getting it on the inside. Can it cause problems? If there's enough fragrance or it's too harsh of a soap, it can cause more problems. Back in the day when I first started piercing, we told everyone the gold dial soap, that harsh triclosan, it's going to clean everything out two times a day. And people just didn't heal forever. So I hope that helps. Clean around the area. Don't get it directly inside. So we have a young fan here who needs some help from you, some sure. advice, because they're kind of on the wrong track. Okay. They've been watching your videos for about a year and have been inspired that they want to have their own piercing shop. They, too, want to want to own their own shop someday. Awesome. They're only 16, 
but the way they've decided to start this is by piercing ears and noses like on their own right now for okay. their friends. So what is the real way to become this a pro? This is not the right path. What is going to happen is you're going to be – you'll get a bad reputation for doing crooked piercings. Things are going to get infected, and you're going to mess a lot of people up. I know you have – good intentions and you think you know, but an apprenticeship takes a long time. There's certain depths, certain angles, the the cleanliness, like to own an autoclave like this sometimes costs several thousand dollars and that needs to be tested every week. You and know? it's not a joke. It's like you don't spend that money for no reason. It's Correct. like that cleanliness is super important. Sterility is extremely important. So um, there's a lot of factors involved and I don't like bringing on apprentices who have a whole bunch of home piercing experience because I know you're full of bad habits and things that aren't proper. And I got to learn to break all of those habits before I can teach you the right new ones. It's kind of a counterbalance. I would rather have someone more fresh and someone who has a lot of piercings and is an enthusiast. Now, if you're serious about getting an apprenticeship and things like that, Get your bloodborne pathogens course. Maybe seek out some some online seminars and you know keep watching videos like this. The more you learn, the better you are. But don't start practicing until you have that license. Also, this being said, if you got caught by the city, this is public endangerment and it could be a felony, and you could get in some serious serious trouble. It's not worth it. And I think you made a great point there that like. Real piercers don't want you if you've done yeah. it on your own. That you'll have like, you'll have a harder time getting a, an apprenticeship and and doing being real about it mm -hmm. if if you've done that. Like I know that some piercers even ask that as a trick question. Like, have you done any piercings? And yeah. you you proudly answer yes, and that gets your application thrown away. Exactly. So. Exactly. So, um, I'm glad you're excited about this, but it's make sure you take the right path so you don't burn bridges for the future. Absolutely. Yes. Do it Do it right. And you can make a legitimate career out of this. This can be something you do like, in, a, in a beautiful shop, like you know, as a professional, you Correct. know, but you Correct. don't want to mess around in your room. Now, speaking of piercings, um, you mentioned earlier there's a video that we could be looking at about yes. some dermals. Yes. Is I this, don't. This I, is for, is this Kieran? For too? Kieran O'Sullivan. Absolutely. One of our fans who, who earlier sent us an awesome yeah, nasal video. Kieran again. All right. All right. <laughs> I don't have it quite queued up, so okay. I will I will quietly do that in the background while we answer the next yeah, question. question. Cool. Uh, Uncrowned King wants to know, would you get a lower conch and wear a hoop to simulate a lobe piercing? What are your thoughts about that? <laughs> um, are you asking for me personally? Because I've actually – I don't have the lobes, and I've actually <laughs> kind of tried doing that before with the upper conch where I wear it, but the ring's too big. So I'd have to wear like an inch and a quarter ring to go through mine, through my conch where I don't wear. But yes, if you did a lower one, you can wear where it goes through. And some people will have like a stretched earlobe piercing and you do a lower conch where you can wear the ring through the conch and the earlobe at the same time. So yes, you totally can. And there is a difference between conch piercings, whether it's upper conch, lower conch, or the straight conch. Sometimes lower conches, if you put a pin in there, the pin's going to point almost straight up and down, similar to this this so great question and i love that yeah all right i hear tried it myself yeah i mean it's it's a cool thought like i hadn't even thought about that until yep, i read yep. the question i was like oh, that makes sense uh akira wants to know is the medusa the one just under the nose or just above the lip very painful um as far as lip piercings yeah it's one of the more painful of the lip piercings but it's still tolerable I still think biting your lip or biting your tongue hurts way more than the piercing will, but it does make your eyes water. It is a good pinch, but it's totally worth it. It's awesome. All right. Awesome. So let's watch up here. Yes, please. These are, uh, I believe, some some dermals that we got done, correct? Yes. All right. Some vampire, vampire bites. bites. All right. So All right, Kieran, let's see what you got going on here. Okay. So doing a dermal piercing with the needle. That's the way I used to do them until before they were illegal. Basically just kind of creating a little pocket right here. Kind of got it because uh, it has a little foot where it goes on both sides. So you kind of need to get one angle and then the other angle. That's just what they're doing right now. Sometimes there's a little bit of bleeding with these. So just kind of a little heads up warning if that's kind of the case. So the pocket. So why do they call these uh, vampire well, basically, right. it's the side of the neck, and it's like kind of trying to replicate. Like right here, they're kind of put the dermal. The dermal's in the end of the tool. They just kind of popped it in there. 
and get that foot inside there and might have just heard a little click. And look at that, one dermal inside there. Awesome. Very cool. Now, as you can see, it's on the side of his neck. And what he's trying to do is replicate vampire bites. If a vampire came up and bit you on the neck, that's where these are going to go. Um, back in the day, what a cool industrial. Again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, back in the day, we used to even pierce people with straight barbells on the side of the neck with the purpose of it not healing. So you'd have the scars where it looks like you had a scar from it, but you can get better results with these dermal anchors. And then also you can put the red gems on there. Actually That's wear super, jewelry. super cool. Yeah. Awesome. So one's down. Is it? Yep. A little tiny bit of bleeding there. Now, the thing about dermal anchors is a lot of times these can reject out. And if they do reject out, a lot of times they might need to be cut out. We'd use pretty much the same type of needle like this. And we just kind of, because underneath, underneath that foot, there's holes and the skin grows in there. That's why we call it anchor. It's actually anchored into the skin a little tiny bit. Um, a lot of people like just get these. They don't even think about how they need to be removed, but they can be a little bit more intense. A little bit of bleeding there. Actually pretty normal for that to happen. Now, I'm curious, Kieran, do you go to the same piercer for all your piercings over there? Where is is in Scott Scotland? I don't remember exactly where Kieran's from. I'm sure we'll get a confirmation yeah. here in a little bit. Awesome. Those look like they're sitting nice and flat. Vampire bites, only appropriate to have a little bit of blood, right? Gotcha. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't wouldn't really be a yeah, vampire bite yeah. if there wasn't blood involved. Awesome, man. Awesome. And sometimes when you do dermals like this, if you get a little bit of bleeding, it looks like there might be a little bit of bruising around there, too. So sometimes that can happen. Very cool. So up next, Misk just wants to agree like what we said earlier about how when you wait till you're 18 and then go wild. Like yep, yep. they did the same thing, got a tattoo and five face piercings when they turned 18. Yep. It's so easy to do. It's that rite of passage moving from one stage to your left. You're now a child. You're now an adult. Oh, so right. Get pierced. <laughs> got to get pierced now. <laughs> Now, Lisa Brown wants to know, how long should I wait until I go to the pool or the beach with fresh nipple piercings? Okay. Nipple piercings, you can go a little bit earlier than normal if, it's a big if, you put Tagaderm bandages over the top. I believe Tagaderm is the name brand, but they're waterproof band-aids. It's going to look like a big piece of saran wrap, and it should fit underneath the bathing suit, and therefore it's going to protect it from any of the germs from getting inside there. You need to protect it for a minimum of a month, sometimes a little bit longer, depending on how you heal. And so it's essentially like a waterproof pasty, sort of? Pretty much. It would just like it's stick on band -aid. and prevent any yes. getting in. The and water. they come in many different sizes, so you find the size that works for you. Um, and like I said, it's, it's like a clear, sticky band-aid. Completely Excellent. clear. Yeah. And that would just keep the, the water from touching you, so you'd be okay. Correct. And this is the safest, only real route to go swimming before it's not an open wound anymore. But a minimum of a month if you're going without the bandage. All right. Preferably longer. Now, hello, Scott. I plan to get a dermal piercing, but I heard that they can pierce the lungs or other vital organs. Is there a high chance of this happening? Um, not with the right piercer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, if you just saw the video we did, and if not, you have to go check the replay, you can see how the needle, when we do the piercings, we're just kind of going parallel with the skin. We're not shooting straight down. So there's no chance of hitting lungs the only chance of hitting lungs would be like a clavicle piercing, like you have your collarbone here. There are piercers who will go under the collarbone and back up. Don't ever do this. You are not my friend if you do this. This is extremely dangerous. This is the only way you could really puncture a lung. So don't do this. Because they go up higher than you expect. But yeah, I mean, like if you're doing a dermal anchor on your chest here, even like you have your ribs before your lungs. Yeah, you so should like, get you're, through. You, there's no way you can go that deep. Um, so yeah, no risk as far as that goes. So your organs are safe. Organs are safe for sure. And then the only other risk for an organ piercing is if you had a belly button piercing and your umbilis, your like your actual belly button came out to the surface and you pierce that. That can be extremely dangerous, but past that, there's no chance of organ damage. Hannah went and got a horizontal eyebrow and they used a curve bar. Kind of wishes that she had seen your video first, yep, but yep. no one no one in the area there uses the surface bars. It gotcha. seems like that's just the way well, they the do it. Well, the thing is, is it still can heal. Um, and if you're having problems, let's go back to the drawing thing here. Now, a normal curved barbell 
or happy face is just like so. Sometimes I have taken in the past and taken like a brass pliers or a pliers to flatten it out like so. So it does replicate more of a surface bar. So if you're having problems, maybe your piercer can try to flatten out that bar on the inside, allowing this to heal a little better for you. It's a possibility. Interesting. So a good piercer can just kind of make those tiny adjustments to it. You know, I haven't done this in a long time because I've had the surface bars. Back in the day, we mainly used uh, uh, surgical stainless steel, which is a lot softer than titanium. Titanium is a little bit tougher to bend without putting marsh or kinks in there. Okay. It's possible, but yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. one of those possibilities. Uh, earlier, we were talking about how quality jewelry generally doesn't come in colors. Uh, Honeymoon Attic does point out, like, can it be anodized though? So it is possible for a jewelry to be colored and still be 100% titanium, correct? Titanium, yes. Niobium, yes. Surgical steel, it can only be silver. So if it's another color claiming to be surgical steel, they are lying to you. Or they painted it. Or they painted it. There might be surgical steel somewhere in there, but the wearing surface is what matters. Right. That's the part touching yeah. your body. Yeah. All right. So yes, anodization is a thing, and that's a way to put color on the titanium or niobium, but it's not Correct. actually a, a paint. And, and I will eventually do a video on anodizing. If you look up, there's other videos on it too. But basically, it's like uh, you get a pool of water, you have some electricity in there, and the voltage is what changes the molecular structure of the surface of the bar, changing the way the light refracts, giving you different colors. Super fancy term for basically saying kind of putting a layer of almost crystals over the top. So sometimes when it's anodized, over time when you wear it, it might fade in color because you're wearing away that crystallized layer. Now, this actually makes titanium even more hypoallergenic than the original state. There's some piercers who won't even pierce unless it's actually anodized titanium. Because that layer of titanium it's oxide is better. Layer. So you're like, I don't know if it's not safe. That's actually even safer. But if it's surgical steel or paint, that's garbage. And red is not a color you'll ever see because things cannot be anodized like Correct. a fire engine red. Correct. Pink, and maybe, but not red. Pink, yeah, you can get pink, but you cannot get red. And you can also not get, um, what's the other color I'm drawing? I'm not sure. Yellows, there's, blues, there's a few shades blue. that yeah. you can't quite yeah. get to. It jumps around in a weird way, but yeah, so generally and bright. Black. You yes. can't get black titanium. You'll see black titanium. That's a PVD coating over the top. If you get niobium, you can kind of get more of a charcoal-ish gray, but you're not going to get a true black. Excellent. Cool. Elvis is having a question about their tragus piercing. It's still healing, no problems, but when I take it off to clean the jewelry from any crusts and my ear, it does not get in straight at the first time. So I think Elvis is actually taking their jewelry completely out. To That's what it. it sounds like to me. Leave your jewelry in. You have implant-grade jewelry, hopefully, which means you can leave it in there for 100 or a couple hundred years, and it should not change. When you clean your piercing, you should be using a wound wash spray, spraying directly on the front and the back of your piercing. Let the solution soften crusties up, and a gentle paper towel or piece of gauze should wipe it off there. Don't remove jewelry, don't spin or rotate it, and don't put any other medical products on there. Peroxide, alcohol, neosporin, all that stuff can cause problems. All right. Cool. Working Mommy of Four has a question that's going to be difficult to answer because it's anatomy dependent. What size to downsize for an industrial? So if someone's got an oversized industrial, everyone's ear is different. How do they know without going to a piercer what size? Is there a way? Um, sometimes if you got an aftercare sheet, your piercer will write the jewelry size on there. Like if you got an inch and a half barbell here at my shop, I will write 14 gauge inch and a half. And then if you're at home and you're like, oh, I have like, you took a ruler up there, like I have a fourth of an inch. So well, you subtract a fourth of an inch from inch and a half. Like I need to order an inch and a quarter barbell. Okay. So that's how you would do it. If you don't know the original size, you would have to measure from inside a bead to the inside of bead. Draw it. Yep. It's basically the same here. Basically, just measure from inside of the bead to the inside of the bead. Okay. Do not measure from outside to outside because the beads do not matter. It's only the inside diameter to inside diameter. I understand you have a straight bar in there. It's just I happen to have the curve drawn up at that time. Right. It's the same way to measure. So that's what you would measure. Um, and then you also figure out how much is sticking out, subtract that from what you measured, and therefore you should be able to order the right size. 
I know it's a lot of work. It's a lot easier to go in and have the piercer do it for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's how you will do it. You'll have to actually measure your ear and then see what size you need personally. Correct. Honeymoon Addict is trying to stretch to a double zero, but mm -hmm. it won't go in. And I accidentally slipped and went too far. Will I still get a blowout even though I took it out immediately? So we're messing around with our ears and we, ow, we heard it. Went too far. Um, chances are you're probably using some sort of a taper to stretch method, um, which can be very dangerous. And if it hurts, you're not ready. Um, the best method is probably going to be using the tape method where you can use like a Teflon tape that's safe to the body, a couple wraps every couple days, and you'd be able to get up to that size. Um, if it ripped or torn, you can possibly leave it in right now, but if it starts getting more infected or irritated, you might need to downsize and back off. If you're doing okay right now, I would say leave it be, but each time you rip or tear your ear, you're making the next, next stretch even more difficult to do. And that's building up the long-term damage that eventually could cause a major problem. Correct. Like the loss like of a lobe. losing an earlobe. <laughs> Take your advice. For real. Is a conch supposed to be done with a curved bar? Because I had it done with one and it's quite irritated, so I'm unsure if I should switch. Also, it's almost like the skin around it is being constantly pulled and bruised. Yeah. Generally, I do a straight one on this one. Um, I'll use a labrette where it has the disc on the backside of the ear, so therefore it doesn't, you know, cut in or stick out too far. Um, I, you can't heal with a curved bar. It sounds like the curved bar might be too long if it's moving back and forth. So maybe downsize. But right now, it depends on how long you've had it. If you've healed that curve in there and try to put it straight, it's a couple steps backwards before it starts feeling better again. But it sounds like it's more length than the actual fact that it's a curve. Very good. Ketzel just sent in a uh, submission for what should I get pierced? So that's awesome. We'll, uh, we'll add that to the list and get to you as soon as we can. We're working on it. And it's quite a lot of people, but we left yeah. doing it. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Sams says, I have fat earlobes. I want to start a gauging journey to maybe a zero. And I think I would still have room to get transverse lobes done. Are you, have you ever done something like that? Yes. All right. Back to the drawing board. So now when I'm drawing my ear here, what they're saying is you have a normal earlobe, and if you did a large piercing, I'm going to draw all the details, kind of get all fancy and stuff here. Okay, so you got your large plug here. What they're saying is they might still have enough room to do a barbell going through like so, or they might be saying could be another ear like so where they did the stretch and still have room for the bar up top above it or below it above or something below, yeah yeah i i like the idea that through the center now that would just through require that it had holes in it like the center plug would have to Correct. have side holes you would have to get custom made plugs where you could drill those holes you could get wood eyelets and then you could do it yourself okay um but it'd be better to start off with metal if you were to heal this up because you need to be at the size you want to be stretched to because it's tough to stretch once the holes are going through that. Okay, because then Otherwise, you're stretching the stretching hole. those holes as well. Angles are going to change and all those factors. Now, a lot of people do the transverse this way. I've also done them vertical. So that almost goes through like uh, the anti-tragus. So through the bottom and then coming straight up in the conch slash anti-tragus area. A lot of cool options there, but get stretched all the way up. And when you're done, send us pictures. I want to see this. Awesome, Jennifer. So hopefully yes. that gives you some ideas or some encouragement to go with your ideas. Super cool. This is a really inspiring video this time. I mean, like a lot of cool new ideas. and Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, send in those pictures. We'd love to show I them to the rest the of the community. Yeah. All right. So we did already talk about the pain on a Medusa. It's a little painful for a lip piercing, it's but in general, man. Still totally worth it. Pain is beauty. Beauty is pain. For oh an God. orbital piercing, Joel wants to know if we should start with two flat back labrays and heal it that way and then switch to the hoop, or do you heal it with the hoop in the first place for an orbital? You should check out my video on orbitals. I talk in depth about this. If you heal it with two different studs, angles can change, and your ring is not going to rest in the proper spot. So if you're healing an orbital, in my opinion, you need to heal it with that ring. Excellent. Miss Anise recently got their conch pierced. How long should we wait before downsizing the piercing on a conch? Two to three months. 
Excellent. If it seems like all the swelling's gone down, you have a bunch of extra bars sticking out, you can totally downsize. It's not 100% necessary unless it's uncomfortable and causing problems. Marco wants to know if it's possible to change snake bite piercings by yourself. Been trying for so long and apparently having some difficulty. Curious what the problem is. A lot of times people can't get the bead off for snake bite, you know, two lip piercings. Um, if you have access to latex or nitrile gloves, it gives you a way better grip. Even taking a paper towel to hold on to the disc on the backside of your lip to be able to twist it off. If you can't get the beads off, which is what I'm guessing, you might need to go to the piercer and have them help you out. Another factor might be is it might not be threaded on there and you might have threadless jewelry, which means it's a straight pin and it's, you just literally got to pull it apart to get it undone. Okay. Kind of tricky to know the difference. Um, but yeah, it is totally, te totally possible to change the jewelry yourself. Just take it out and the new one should fall right into place. Now we've You've healed the tube of scar tissue and it's easy to change. Now we've talked about this before and you said that the problem usually is friction with their fingers. It's that yes. you're trying super hard, but you're actually not pinching on the bead enough. So if they don't have access to gloves, were you saying that washing your hands, like trying to get all your natural grease yes. off? Yes, really good soap that takes all the oils off your hands. Even taking a rubbing alcohol, put that on your fingers to kind of dry them out and you're just gonna get a better grip and it's just gonna go. You know, there's a lot of people who come into the shop, like, I've been trying to get this bead undone forever, and their fingers are all dented and because they're, they're pinching so hard because it keeps slipping. And then I put on gloves and go, they get real mad. Because <laughs> they don't realize. Because <laughs> you're, you're pinching instead of turning. Yeah. So yeah. Your, your force is going to the wrong place. Yep. All right. So hopefully that's some good advice. Force is going to the wrong place. That's exactly what it is. Spending more time pinching than twisting. So hopefully that helps, Marco. Yes. And with this new advice, maybe you'll even get those things unscrewed. Good luck to you. All right. We are working our way towards the end of our stream today. So we're going to answer a few oh, more so questions. Quick. It always does. We love talking to you guys. So if I get an eyebrow piercing, can I possibly hide the scar if my eyebrows are bushy or is the scarring really visible? It depends on how you scar. Every person scars differently. Um, like, if you look kind of carefully from where I'm at, you can see a little bit of something on my eyebrows. My eyebrows have been pierced over a dozen times on each side. I don't really scar much. And all my piercings have been probably a minimum of 14 gauge because that's just the way I am. So some people scar, some people don't. The bushier your eyebrow, the less chance people will be able to see that scar tissue. Um, it shouldn't be discolored, but you might have that little divot you know, kind of where the piercing used to be. Now, if the piercing comes all the way out, you won't grow hair in that area and the scar will be extremely visible. So if it's rejecting, 100% take it out. Paul is an enthusiast with 29 piercings and looking for an upper helix orbital next. How rough would you say that is? Um, If you have 29 piercings, it's, it's towards the top. It's not that bad to get. It just sucks to heal. <laughs> not going to lie, but they look so cool. Austin wants to know what piercings in your experience have the highest chances of rejecting? What piercings have the highest? Yeah, what are some low percentages? that don't have a good solid ridge. Same thing with eyebrows where the skin's extremely tight. And also nipples that the nipple doesn't protrude and it's nice and flat against the breast. Those are the ones that typically reject the most. Um, I'm kind of looking at the TV right now myself. If you had a vertical lip and you didn't, yeah, it's just inappropriate anatomy for the piercings and we would generally say something beforehand a good piercer should yeah. warn you ahead of yeah. time but eyebrows can reject navels and nipples those are the most popular uncrown king on the subject of what we were saying earlier with different materials and different colors uh is struggling to find red nose rings that are stainless or titanium and wants to know if they can put any sort of paints on them basically no and there isn't really any safe red jewelry is there no there really isn't at all um I know aluminum can be anodized closer to the red, but aluminum is not safe to wear. And aluminum anodization is still dying. Yeah. It, it doesn't, it's not is like it? a layer of crystals. It's, they're still applying a dye. It's just the dye sticks to the layer that's of crystals. It's so bright. Yeah. Okay. That's why aluminum is really bright is because it's still dying. Okay. Okay. No, the answer is no. If you want red, the, your best option is going to be getting a red gem. Okay. Get you a know? bright red jewel of some yeah, sort. Yeah, but as far as getting the whole bar itself or the, yeah, it's not going to work. Um, you might be able to get red opals. Is it, was this for an eyebrow piercing? Uh, we're looking for a nose ring, a nose ring. No, I can't think of, uh, they might be able to get glass, a red glass. Mm -hmm. I think gorilla glass might make colored rings and, but 
Okay. Yeah, I would suggest stretching it up. I don't know if I want to wear that thing of a ring and a nose. That'd be easily breakable. I, I don't know. So red, red is tough. And red is tough. Anodization, the anodization can get you pinks and sort of like purplish Purples, reds. magenta-ish. Yeah, kinda, but yeah. not a, not like a red. bright red red, not like an apple not red. Not quality stuff. You can, yeah. Okay, so we're going to wind up a couple more questions. Do all facial piercings leave a visible scar if I decide to take them out in the future, like for job interviews? Depends on the person. Generally, you're going to expect something, but it's not going to be that, that bad. Okay. And last uh, are so many questions. I feel bad at the end every time because I have to ignore so many questions when we leave. We're not ignoring. We just run out of time. I if know. I could stay here all day, I would. But we have videos to shoot for you guys. It's true. We have a lot of videos <laughs> to make today. This is an so, all-day procedure for us. So Queen is asking a very good question that I think a lot of people get confused about. How often should I be removing and cleaning my jewelry once my piercing is healed? And what would you recommend for cleaning the titanium piercing? This is 100% a video we are planning on making sooner than later about how to clean your jewelry and you technically don't need to remove your jewelry to clean your piercing unless your jewelry needs to be cleaned, you know? And then um, just stay tuned for the new video coming out. Hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll have how to properly clean your jewelry. Yep. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you. Again, if you want some of your cool piercings or if you have piercing problems with pictures send them to piercing with scott at gmail.com and we'll do our best to get to you uh again give us a like make sure you're subscribed and of course keep putting holes in your body see you on the next video